Welcome back everyone to State of Play with Brandon Bales. I'm Brandon Bales, of course, and today I am with Greg Kasavin. Uh, he's an industry vet for over 15 years, 10 of which he spent at GameSpot.com as a critic, an intern, and eventually editor-in-chief. Uh, Greg then went on to work for uh, EA for a year, or three years, 2K Games, and then now he's with Supergiant Games uh, here in Northern California. Uh, Supergiant, of course, released Bastion last year to great critical acclaim. It's won over a hundred awards. It's colorful, it's unique, and um, we're here to talk about that game and his whole career. So, Greg Kasavin, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, so, I'm just, what I'm so excited, or why I'm so excited about having you on the show is that you're the first person that pops into my mind um, as a serious or, or a long-time game journalist who's become, you know, a seriously successful game designer. Uh, and as we were talking before, you said that you're maybe not the first one, that, or the only one you can think of. Um, what, can, can, can you think of any others right now off the top uh, of your head? I, I can. <laughs> uh, like, one of the first that, that comes to mind is, um, uh, is Emil Pagliarulo, I think I got his last name right, who's, okay. the, who's the lead designer, I believe, of Fallout 3, and uh -huh. um, worked on uh, worked on like a Oblivion as as well. Um, he uh, worked at a he he has a background in the gaming press. I don't I don't know him personally, but he's just someone I remember reading his byline. Cool. You know, around the time I was getting started and stuff like that. Uh, so he's one example. Um, and there, um, you know, there there, there are there are a number of others, but uh, yeah, I guess it's a relatively. You know, it's it's not a super common path necessarily, but in in my case, I. I always, like I I've wanted to make games since I was a little kid, mm -hmm. uh, and if anything, I just like I really fell in love with writing about them to the point where I, I like woke up one day and had been doing it for more than ten years. And it's <laughs> just had, I still loved it, um, but felt like if I don't at least try this other thing, it, you know, the I might never get a chance because game development is sort of a young field, and by the time you're in your as in my like later twenties at the time, like oh my god, it's gonna be too late. <laughs> I'm in my I'm 28 or 29, and my whole life is passing me by. But. I, I want to come back to this, and because I want to get, I want to get that whole story. Sure. I'm so excited about that. Um, but um, I think first, um, I want to, I want to talk briefly about Bastion, and we'll come back to that even later. Okay. Um, we were talking a little bit beforehand, but is there anything new for Bastion uh, now at the end of 2012? Uh, well, we've been um, we've been pretty kind of surprisingly busy with it all this year, considering mm -hmm. it came out last summer, um, and um, we just a few months ago we released a version of the game for the iPad, which I think you know a year ago I wouldn't have expected we would end up doing that necessarily, and then and then just today, and I apologize that this is like shameless opportunistic timing but it, it ju we just updated it so it's also on uh on the iphone now at least the 4s and the 5 so we've we've done um we've made all these different versions of of bastion you know since the original xbox launch it's on pc and linux and mac and we did like the chrome web store there's a web-based version of it and now now these ios versions and that's all been super valuable to us um uh, but uh, you know especially from like a just learning you know as a small studio things are so kind of chaotic these days in the game industry like we don't know what people are going to be playing games on you know <laughs> two years from now so we just are trying to keep those those uh muscles sort of in good shape where we can like figure out what how to how to make the game how to make our games work on you know just about any platform yeah so so is that a conscious thing and i mean I, it's so funny. I, I've been a fan of games for so long, but I almost could care less about the programming, which is terrible to say, you know. But I mean, I don't. I mean, yeah. not, I, it's not like I could care less. But you know, I I, I feel like I'm in it for the emotion. Yeah, stuff. it's the the result is is what matters. So right. Yeah. Um. So, but but that, but that, so that being said, like, excuse if this is excuse me if this is an ignorant question, but you know, how do you, I mean, how do you streamline a game? I mean, and how does it affect the company? When you when you have this project, uh, the product, you know, that's so done, right. and, I mean, you want it to be done, I'm guessing, but, yeah. you know, how do you take that and shave off edges and make it fit into a different box? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's it's different every time is, yeah. is the short answer. <laughs> I mean, in our in our case, it's like our, our sort of 
spiritual approach to it is like the um, every version of the game that we make has got to be sort of the best version. We're not going to like farm them out and make just sort of in, inferior ports because for the person who plays that version, that's going to be their whole experience with the game. So it had, it had better be good. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we, uh, you know, our, I'm not an engineer either. I wish mm -hmm. I could, if, if there's like one skill, I don't know, it's <laughs> high on the list anyway, but if <laughs> one of the skills I wish I could just magically have is, mm -hmm. is um, being a, a I, I wish I could program, but I cannot. Uh, but we work with, uh, th there are uh, several engineers on our team who can somehow get this thing running on totally different devices, and that's a big a part of the technical challenge is like getting everything and fitting into memory and getting it to look the way it's supposed to look and, ru and run smoothly. Like it was very important to us that Bastion be like a smooth feeling game mm -hmm. and that the frame rate doesn't chug and that sort of thing. Um, and that's all just you know, very hard work on the engineering front that I am also <laughs> just, you know, largely ig ignorant of. <laughs> um, and then you, in the in the case of the iPad uh, version, and I guess also the PC version at the time, there's a design challenge as well, which is like translating the, the interface, because how you, how you interact with a game is fundamentally important to whether you're going to enjoy that game or not. Mm -hmm. And Bastion was originally designed sort of with a, with a controller in mind, though we, we always knew it would come out on PC as well, so we had like mouse and keyboard in the back of our heads. Mm -hmm. We didn't necessarily think it would come to a device where you would just be poking the screen <laughs> um, with no sort of tactile input and any of that. And I'm the sort of, whatever, I'm, as someone who's been playing games for a long time, I, it, it's not my first impulse to love that kind of interface. Because um, I like, I like my buttons, you Me know, too. like Street Fighter controllers with as many. Yeah. Steel Battalion, whatever, as many buttons as possible. <laughs> bring it on. But um, so, so we had to do some real kind of soul searching around. Like, is this even gonna? Can we bring this over to this platform and have it not be terrible? Um, and that, and we were willing to invest a certain amount of time into figuring that out. And we were also willing, at the end of that process, to just walk away from it and be like, nope, this is terrible. We've learned a valuable lesson here. Um, and if we ever want to make a game for touch devices, you know, here's all the reasons why this style of game <laughs> wouldn't work. Right. So anyway, um, yeah, the control stuff took, it took us a long time on, on, uh, uh, on iPad. Um, and uh, thankfully the, the response has been really, really good. Um, so I'm, I'm glad, you know, in that respect that the effort, uh, paid off, but it, it definitely, we didn't want to sort of settle for the virtual joystick thing, which for whatever reason is a pretty common yeah. convention, but I feel like, you know, that that's not a, it's not a great way to play games in general because you're just reminded that you could be playing games on, like, with like a real joystick with <laughs> real buttons mm -hmm. or something like that, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, which is a control scheme that we do offer, um, but, but the main, the default control scheme is just meant to feel at home where you can play the whole thing kind of one-handed tapping around and so forth. That's um, a big challenge. Yeah. Um, and the other, you know, cool thing that ended up happening with that version was like, we always wanted Bastion to be really easy for people to pick up and start playing. Um, so, you know, the way that's expressed in the Xbox version is, hey, if you know how to like hold a controller and press buttons, you'll probably figure out how to start playing this game. And there's no real, you know, tutorial stuff or anything. You just kind of figure it, figure it out as you go. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if I hand my a, a controller over to like my daughter who was like five or six at the time, she doesn't. It's like holding an alien pod or something. <laughs> she doesn't know what to do with that thing. It's got like sixteen buttons on it. Um, <laughs> but uh, but man, when you hand over like an so I have two kids and my my two year old son, he already like knows how to use iPads and iPhones. It's it's insane. He's just like opens the photo app and starts like flipping through photos. So. Uh, they really know what they're doing as far as like the intuitiveness of that interface and there's something to be said for making a game that anyone could just pick up and mm -hmm. figure, figure it out and the interface isn't like a big barrier to people's enjoyment. So, yeah. Isn't it so funny having grown up with all that and, and <laughs> it's just so second nature to us and it, it seems so funny that, that people can't just 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's not. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that I'm I I'm always reminded of how much sort of built-in foreknowledge there is when I whenever I play like a first-person shooter or like mm -hmm. a real-time strategy game, like anything involving like mouse and keyboard. Like mouse and keyboard is a great interface for games, but it was never. That's not what it's there for. It's right. something that was just like co-opted to work well for games, but it, it's like the assumptions. You know the things you need to know before you can even begin to play a PC game like that are pretty high. You know you need to know you know how to use a mouse, you need to know to type on a keyboard, and right. all this stuff. Whereas on you know it's going to be a long time before my two year old can do all that. <laughs> right. but iPad he could just hammer away and have fun. It's, I'm so curious. I have no idea where this industry is going. Yeah, I mean I I have mixed feelings about that stuff as well. Like I don't. I don't know that it's good that I have a two-year-old who <laughs> play, plays on an iPad all the time. But That's funny. Do you think this is why it's taken so long for, for Microsoft and PlayStation to announce their next plans because they're so confused about what they need to do next? For, um, you know, well, I, I think that's a super complicated issue. Um, I do think it's a, it's a time now when... Uh, things have changed, and and Microsoft and Sony and are gonna have to respond to like what's what's been happening, and and you know, um, iOS, you know, Apple and 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 Android, it's that stuff has changed the way that people play games. Mm -hmm. They no longer, as much, you know, walk around with their Game Boys or Nintendo D. It's like they have a, a huge amount of video game power built mm -hmm. into the thing that they already have. Mm -hmm. um, and those games are super easy to get. They're super cheap or they're free. And a lot of them are really good. Yeah. <laughs> um, more and more of them are really, really good. So it's like when you compare that, you know, not just as like a, yeah, sort of the cost benefit of like, hey, you can buy, you know, a $60 game in a store. I mean, it's it, people will say it's apples and oranges, but it's all just people's spare time, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, time that we spend playing, or, you know, recreational time we spend playing games. Um, in my own case, more I'm one of those people who did not expect to, like, I, I just can't, yeah, I'm very surprised that I spend way more time now, like, playing iPad games or something than, like, Xbox games. Mm -hmm. That is... A year, year and a half ago, I would have said, "You're crazy." You would have said, "In a year, you, know, you may think you're you're comfortable with your Xbox right now, but it's partly because you know I got into it in part because we started making games for it ourselves." Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, it, it, there's so much great stuff there. Um, but there are other reasons why this, like the current generation of consoles has lasted longer. Like, everyone wanted it to last longer. Like, it, yeah. it, it killed everyone that they... The transition into the current generation was sort of very painful. Like, uh, learning the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox, like, the the increased costs on developers were extremely high. So they are all like, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could have these consoles for longer? That way, all our domain knowledge, uh, you know, once we master the PS3 and the Xbox... We don't have to like throw all that out and learn a new console immediately, mm. uh, but you know now you hear people complaining that this console generation has gone on for too long <laughs> and they want the new ones to come out already. So yeah. I, I don't you know people are gonna complain one way or another. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean the way you know just di digital distribution, all these uh, there there are all these sort of new forces in the world that that weren't there quite as strongly when the PS3 and the Xbox 360 came around. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff like uh, Xbox Live Arcade on, on the Xbox, I think, was very sort of pioneering um, and, and opened a lot, you know, pushed a lot of smaller games, helped help them sort of go very far, uh, farther than they could have in the past. But then there are also things like Steam. I mean, Steam is, yeah. <laughs> has, done a, has just done an incredible job of, like, pushing games that I think previously... Uh, may, you know, under different circumstances, might have struggled more to find an audience. Right. But um, Steam just makes it really simple to find stuff. So yeah, I mean, uh, just speaking for myself, it's like I I buy games digitally most of the time now. Um, 
why go to the store and <laughs> get get like the sixty seven dollar uh you know, empty case with a disc mm -hmm. in it and mm -hmm. then spend a bunch of time putting in like an online passcode or something before it can even play, whereas mm -hmm. on, on Steam you could just get the thing be playing oh. immediately. So Oh, it's all cool stuff, and it all still keeps changing, so who knows where it's going to be in yeah. another year or two. Gosh, does that scare you? I mean, being um, part of a, you know... Yeah, I mean, it, it's scary to a certain extent. Like, it cha you know, change is scary, change is also <laughs> good. Uh, that's like, I, I don't know why... I, I can reconcile those things sort of peacefully. I'm, I'm okay <laughs> with both of those states. Um, yeah, as I've, as I've alluded to, I mean, there was part of me that that was sort of very, made very uncomfortable by this sense of like sort of encroachment by I like touch gaming, like what, like what is, what is this? Just let me play games with my buttons, <laughs> leave me alone. I don't want everything to turn into free to play nonsense and stuff like that. Give me the, my buttons. The, well, the, that was the other thing. It's like, I, I was also one of those people with like, just in an, uh, you know, I couldn't even help it, but I had an automatic just sort of chip on my shoulder around like free to play stuff. It's just like, oh, it's it's one of those, right? Uh, you I know, still do. And, yeah. But but the games, like two of the games I've played more than anything else this year, are Hero Academy on on iOS, which is a free game, and and Dota Two uh, from Valve, which is also free. So it's like, <laughs> okay, I guess I need to shut up about those because that's what I'm spending my time playing personally so it's it's just um so yeah i think it's uh it seems like the most dangerous thing to do is to sort of maintain the status quo these days and that you're better off trying to do something different um but i think you know the thing that i i've always believed is that like pe people are people don't get enough credit uh, for their ability to like discern quality i think people mm -hmm are good judges of quality in general. And all other things being equal, they'll take the good thing over the bad thing, like if two options present themselves. Right. So um, it's certainly not enough just to make a good game and hope it does well. Um, I don't think that's sufficient these days and you need to have some sort of a plan for how people are gonna find out about it and all kinds of stuff. But I don't think the part where you make a good game being a necessary component to success, I don't think that's like gonna go away, mm -hmm. or at least, um, yeah. So I I, I like, uh, you know, it's it's been cool to see games going in in these different directions and seeing what what comes out of it. And I still, you know, do my own personal gut check of like, do I still like games? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I still I still play them all the time. Okay, it's cool. I'm not sick of them. So. I, I sometimes worry about that, you know, yeah. that, that, but, and, and people can complain a lot about how, oh, it's just, you know, it's just the seventh iteration of first person shooter series or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, if all you pay attention to is the shooter series, then yes, you might, you might get bored, but there's so much stuff. I don't think, I don't think people can, I don't think there's like a sort of a valid accusation to be made that games are like stagnant or something there's a ton of interesting stuff happening you just need to know where to look mm -hmm. so and it could be hard to um, cut through all the noise granted yeah well it certainly represents a lot of new challenges for a company so yeah you know bravo to you sir and your team for well th thanks so I, I think it um, we we feel fortunate that we're small um, yeah. in, the, in that in that respect we're we were seven people on Bastion, and we're nine people now. Um, so it's not even that small for like an, you know, you, you've got independent studios that are like one or two people. So we're, I guess we're kind of medium sized <laughs> for, a, for a small studio. But um, it just means that we can not have to plan that far ahead. Mm -hmm. Like when I was working at Electronic Arts, and I don't think this is revealing any Grand C it's like true of any big company. They they got their plan for like the games they're gonna make for like several years out. Yeah. You know, they know that they know they're making part three of this and then part four of it a couple of years later or whatever. In our case, it's just very it's much more uh, what's the word? Impulsive isn't quite the word because that makes it sound like 
It's we're just doing. We're just waking up and doing whatever, right. which certainly <laughs> isn't the case. But, but we can react to, you know, the the iPad version of Bastion being a good example. It's like if 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 Bastion hadn't done particularly well, or if we didn't, we weren't like interested in making that version. We just wouldn't have done it. It's not like we were somehow committed to doing any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it it feels good to be able to decide, you know, how we what's the best use of our time in that respect and, mm. and balance, you know, kind of supporting our, our existing game and, and figure, figuring out what's next and all that kind of mm. stuff. Um, this is a sort of a general question. Uh, take it as you will. Uh, were you, was Bastion as successful as you hoped it would be or uh, did it surpass expectations? Uh, it, it certainly, um, yes to both of those okay. questions. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we're yeah, yeah no it's done it's done I think it's fair to say it's done a, a lot better than we it's lived up to our kind of wildest fantasies of how it might do like things that we wouldn't even talk to each other about I'm sure we all had the little secret hope where it's like hey yeah. maybe this will be really maybe everyone will really like this thing but it's not anything that it, it's not the kind of we we, we planned for uh, complete failure scenarios, and we also plan for like, you know, ver varying degrees of success, um, based on you know just based on like data that we had collected of how other games had done and stuff like that, um, and um, it wasn't it wasn't just like a grand slam thing. It just the the part that really surprised because because the initial Xbox launch like it did well, but it didn't do, for example, it. It didn't do like nearly as well as something like Limbo had done the the, the previous year, um, in terms of sales. Um, um, but um, but over time, it just kind of kept going, and and it really found, it found like a, a really, just like a growing audience on on PC. That while we were you know when we were developing the game, we we thought that it would. You know, if we if we were to have guessed sort of what the audience split would be, we would have figured most of our audience would be on console. Mm. Um, but uh, it, but it turned out we had a very large audience on on PC as well. Cool. Um, so that was really cool because uh, because we we thought we were making kind of a console style game, but more and more, I mean, the PC game players are, are very discerning and not, but also not particular about the the style of game you know, like games that are purely sort of console focused have done uh, very well on PC mm -hmm. um, obviously in, in recent years so um, so yeah that that um, if nothing else you know the response to the game it's been very encouraging to us as a team it, it sort of validated our approach to game making um, but it also meant in a um, it also meant we could keep going and make another game, like self-fund more projects, because um, Bastion was self-funded. We were very; it was very important to us to make a game sort of on our own terms without uh, a bunch of external influences on it. Um, and being in the position to do that again feels really, really good. And we, uh, and at the same time, we feel obviously a certain amount of pressure to make sure we make good on that. On the opportunity to do that and yet we felt that way kind of all along with Bastion in the first place it felt and Bastion felt like as we were working on it I think all of us shared a sense that like this this is our whatever happens this is our one chance to kind of really contribute personally to something that we all care a lot about and hopefully people will like it that was just kind of the mindset but if 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 it fails well we'll always have Bastion, we were like, we, we were committed to making sure, you know, we, we, it was very important to us that we at least like it, like when, when it's done, like we're not just going to release whatever when the deadline comes, we're going to make sure that we've done everything we could to make something that we feel pretty good about and hopefully people will share that feeling. But yeah, we kind of, we had no idea, you know. We had no idea really how people would take it overall. It's just impossible to tell. <laughs> it, it always is. Especially like, 
especially once you leave like the continental like we had the, the the fact that the game has a has like an audience in some foreign countries and stuff i mean we we localize the text into a few languages but we never we decided we're we're not going to it's going to be english voiceover no matter what and if you don't know english you're kind of going to be screwed right. when you play this game because the voice is an important part right. um but yeah i mean people not some non-english speakers seem to like it anyway and that's not something we could have expected that makes me happy yeah it's it's interesting you obviously have been a big games fan your whole life and been wanting to do it for a long time when you um you joined uh gamespot as an intern is mm -hmm. that is that right? yeah um did you ever dream that like in 10 years later that you'd be you were basically in charge of the site did you have I uh, know. Yeah, no. I, I I don't. I'm not. I I was not one of those. Uh, I was not one of those kids who like thought he was gonna. I'm gonna grow up to be president or whatever. Like I don't. <laughs> uh, yeah. I I don't necessarily have. Uh, I don't even know how to put it in a way that doesn't sound like very morbid. Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I loved, I just, it, it was more immediate to me. Um, I loved games and I liked, uh, liked writing and started writing about them and it just wanted to do something productive with it. I was just like spending way too much time hmm. playing games where <laughs> I started to feel like really just kind of gross about it. Like sure. I had to, I have to do something with this. So I got to writing writing about it and I was super thrilled to get the GameSpot intern, internship even though um, <clears throat> I'd been like working on my own websites and had like a previous uh, game writing job before that like uh, straight out, you know, shortly after I left uh, high school. Um, but but yeah, I mean my uh, the, the, the anecdote I tell is like when when I got the GameSpot internship and I was still living at home and stuff, um, and I was all stoked and my parents are like, yeah, that's fine, but like, what are you going to be doing in five years? Oh. Um, and I, and I'm like, you know, I don't know what it, my answer was at the time, but the feeling I had was like, well, this should be, this shouldn't be seen as like some sort of illegitimate thing of like, I'm not like, f what I was about to say something offensive. I was about to say, like, I'm not, like, flipping burgers, whatever. Maybe that's t that's probably totally legitimate, too. But you know what I mean. It's like, it's not... I felt that it, it should be something that could be... It could become a career or whatever, but, uh, you know, I, I was generally too busy with the immediate work to, like, think what I was going to be doing five or ten years later. And, yeah, as it turned out, you know, the job didn't go away, and it kept getting, you know... GameSpot got bigger and bigger, and there was more interesting stuff to do, and there were always uh, games to review and to write about and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, the time, the time went by fast, mm -hmm. um, and and it felt like, I mean, working at a site like that, it was, it was often tough, really, because it's just your work is just never ever done. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that there are too many professions these days where someone can go home like, yeah, all my work is done. And I feel completely at peace. But uh, yeah, it, it felt like it, we were always kind of treading water and trying to do the most with what we had and all that. But I, I, I grew to like that feeling, I guess, or I, I'm just used to it and uh, feels in a way comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. um, um, and yeah, and it meant that on a, on a, purely personal level, I could keep on playing tons and tons of games and feel like I was justified yeah. in doing so as part of my job. Um, so yeah, that was that was cool. Um, but no, I mean, the, even even since I left uh, in at the beginning of 2007, the turns that my, my sort of, uh, my job, career, whatever, have taken have been pretty... I couldn't have predicted, you know, it's, it's a, it's a pretty chaotic industry and mm -hmm. the, that's the only part that I expect like, well, things will not be particularly stable for very long. <laughs> this is the one assumption I have. 
uh, what did your parents say after those five years? Were they were they They're, pleased? Were they? I think after a while, I think probably like eight years into GameSpot, <laughs> they were like, okay, all right, he's he's not, you know, he's not slumming us for money or whatever. Right, like, right. I guess I guess things are okay. Um, but yeah, so they they came to, they they uh, they came to accept it, and 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 to their, you know, to their credit, they, I was born in Moscow. I was like two and a half or whatever, and my my mother's a neurologist and my father's like an engineer, so they wow. they come from you know traditional sort of high education types of uh, professions, and and they brought me and my brother to the land of opportunity where we could right. make great things of ourselves too or whatever so so they were when we were growing up they were pretty appalled i'm sure at times to see like i'm just playing video games all the time my brother was like going to nightclubs or something totally different but also probably in their eyes just like mortifying just like oh my god <laughs> like neither of these guys is going to be a doctor um, um but yeah we somehow we somehow made it work i mean hmm. And and uh, they they you know they were concerned that I was playing games as much as I was when I was growing up, but they but they didn't like, but they could tell that it was something that I loved and they didn't like stop it right they they're like okay well that's cool at least you find at least you found something that you care about so they right. they uh, I I looking back on it I think they sort of. Um, found a very good balance there of like they they challenged me to try to do something productive with it mm -hmm. considering I was spending all that time on it anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like you got your wish. Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so, would you say that your transition out of GameSpot was a natural one um, because of just meeting so many people and continually talking about the development process and like how did how did how did that idea first come about? I mean, obviously that was there in the back of your mind the whole time. But what were the significant milestones that made you say, "I should do this"? You know. Yeah. All right. Um, well, the uh, first thought, the the idea really, I guess it it, it became increasingly sort of uh, subconscious for me because I I became very I wouldn't have uh, been at Gamespot for for ten years if I didn't I I was just kind of completely enthralled in in that work. Um, but occasionally, yeah, I would sort of snap out of it uh, and be like, oh, well, am I just going to do this forever or am I going to ever get a chance to, to work on games? Um, and over time, the fact that I even had that thought became an increasing concern to me because the way um, we did things at GameSpot, um, partly through my own uh, sort of enforcement, was we, it was very important to us that people who are in like a critical capacity like me I was reviewing a lot of games have no have don't have like ties to developers um, to keep their coverage uh, as, as sort of a, yeah. uh, un, unbiased right. as, as possible like uh, like we're not gonna like I'm not gonna review a game if I have like buddies on the development team or something like that and so I um, so Anyway, 10 years into my stint at GameSpot, I still didn't really know anyone in the game industry because of that. Um, they probably knew of me because I'd slaughtered their games or something like that. And like, oh, that's not going to help me, you know, get, how, how do I even do this? So that, that made me, but, but it was, um, it was kind of only a few months before I left that, that I'm like, okay. I sort of mentally crossed a point of no return where I realized I like want to do this soon, and that was actually right around E three of the of two thousand six, and and they, I think the two games I saw at the time were like it was like Bioshock and Assassin's Creed or something like that, which were like they were just the just sort of the world building the everything about them was just very very exciting to me, and I'm like I just really want a chance to be a part of something like that at some point. But I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and and it wasn't until, you know, turns out the old uh, adage of it's not what you know, it's who you know, um, ended up benefiting me after all, because a former colleague of mine who, who I worked with at GameSpot, he had 
taken a job at Electronic Arts some years prior, and we were still friends, and he knew, uh, um, he knew I wanted to make games at some point, and he's like, hey, we have a producer opening here at Electronic Arts, is this still something you're interested in? And I told him yes, and I applied, and I got that job. Wow. Um, and so, and, and, and yeah, I left GameSpot on like a Tuesday and then started at EA, you know, the following Monday or whatever. <laughs> it was like no time off in between. Um, so, uh, but, but I felt, I felt pretty prepared because I, I, I thought I was prepared um, because I think it helped me in my case that um, w since I was editor in chief at that time, my job was much more than just you know r writing about games at that point uh, and i was working on the website itself and i was working very closely with like our our production department and our and our art department and and even our like sales and marketing department and all this kind of stuff cuz gamespot was a product and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff and i felt that that sort of um that that would help me um and that's part of the reason that i you know i think i was able to successfully argue that I could be qualified for a production job in, in games because I was essentially doing sort of a production job at GameSpot mm. in that respect. Um, so yeah, I think if I hadn't had experience working with artists and programmers and stuff like that, that things would have been, things would have gone a lot rougher. Mm. Um, and I'd also, I, I also just try to be really realistic about it and had heard a lot of the horror stories um, and knew that game development is not like fun. Like, <laughs> like very few people will tell you that. Oh, this is you know, this isn't the people who do it are are not often the ones saying like this is the dream job or whatever. So I just try to be very realistic about my expectations there, um, and that uh, was helpful because it was a total roller coaster ride. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to go through the experience and um, and uh, and yeah, mm -hmm. I've I've kept uh, kept at it, I guess, one way or another. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> and that was in two thousand seven, right? Yeah, the that's when I went to yeah. EA, and then I was at EA for um, just under three years, cool. working on the uh, Command and Conquer series, right. and then some some canceled stuff that never got announced uh, at the end. Mm. Um, um, that's where I met the the two guys who uh, co-founded uh, Supergiant, cool. so I'm still working with that those guys. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to come back to that. Well, <laughs> yeah, I want to come back to that. I want to come back to... We'll get that. Um, can you speak to... I know it happened... Um, I know it happened after you left the company, but can you speak about Gerstengate? Um, uh, <laughs> sure. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, a, a lot of um, it did. It did happen um, almost a year after I left, mm -hmm. uh, and I was I was kind of a, I was a reader of Gamespot at that point, so I was just kind of as a lot of people were sort of shocked by what was happening and. And I was one of those people, like, I didn't understand. My, my stance on it was, like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, apparently some people saw fit to fire Jeff. Okay, I'm going to try to make no... I don't know what happened, right. and I'm going to... Let's say I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that Jeff, you know, uh, like, slashed their car tires and did all <laughs> kinds of really horrible things to deserve <laughs> getting fired. Even still, the, the, the way in which it happened... Um, hurt a bunch of people who had nothing to do with it, and that was the part that was so um, upsetting at the time, as as like you, you know, as a fan of GameSpot, because the people who were the people who suffered for it were were, and I'm sure Jeff, um, it, it must have been incredibly hard on Jeff, but it was also clearly incredibly hard on the people who stayed, because they're collective reputation was tarnished exactly. at the time and it's like well you now anyway it was a it, that was a pretty painful uh i i i empathized 
with what was happening. It was uh, fairly uh, painful for me, and I couldn't help thinking, like, I, I don't know. I wish I could have done something or some, something like that, but I would, at, at that point, it, it was just none of uh, none of my business in a way, other yeah. than as a as a reader and supporter of the site. But um, everything, I mean, it's it's also one of those weird uh, silver lining things because we sort of got Giant Bomb out of it, and I love I love Giant Bomb. What hmm. those guys and what those guys do, I still go to Gamespot as well. So hmm. it's like I think everything. It was all, you know, for as painful as it was, it was one of those things where I was reminded that, like, the worst catastrophes on the internet thing, when it feels like the sky is falling, like, it still, it still blows over. It always blows over. Right. Um, Because there was, there were times at GameSpot that, while I was there, that were also incredibly bleak that, like, no one remembers anymore because it was, you know, 10 or more years ago. It's just, feels like the worst thing at the time, and you just kind of keep showing up and keep doing keep doing your best and hopefully people will just kind of get over it. I mean, in the case of the the Gerstmann thing, they just, the part that was so painful was like in the first week or so, there was just no uh, official acknowledgement of what happened. And yeah. that was the part that I was like, dude, this guy's been here for more than 10 years and has like million, probably millions of dedicated readers who like deserve to know deserve at least a goodbye from yeah. him like he wasn't allowed to say goodbye and that's that's not that's not fair to his readers no. forget about what he did yeah. so that that was the part that anyway um since you asked yeah of course um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that's uh but yeah then the amazing thing is he's uh you know they're they're back in the same they're back in the same building again now and <laughs> um a lot of the guys uh, some really and great people who, who I was working with uh, at the time at GameSpot are still there now, and um, uh, you know navigating it through these uh, these current uh, chaotic waters and stuff like that, and it's mm. amazing to see uh, Jeff and those guys still at it as well. Like I don't know if I, because like I said, it, it was it was pretty tough. So I I I'm sometimes like blown away that those guys are still have sort of the the fortitude to keep doing it after all this time so it can it can take a lot out of you mm -hmm. um especially like yeah holiday season yeah. crunch and all this kind of stuff yeah I, I mean honestly i'm barely involved in it i mean even though i do you know some writing as well and even, it, it's hectic for me just to <laughs> yeah. like to get out a review in any sort of timely fashion you know because i want it to be considered and you know with real insight and uh I mean, maybe I'm just lazy, I guess. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not lazy. I'm not. Um, anyway, so um, you worked at EA for about a year, you said, or uh, three close years? to close to three. Sorry, yeah, yeah, three. Um, and primarily it was on. Oh yeah, well you said that Command and Conquer and some other yeah. unannounced projects. Are you allowed to? You can't say what those are. Are you? Are you? Uh, allowed to? uh probably not. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they. Yeah, the, the, like it's stuff that d didn't go, right. didn't end up uh, going anywhere. All right. Um, so. Cool. Uh, and then you were at 2K for a for year? For a year, yeah. Um, so, so what was that like? Was that, was that um, did Supergiant uh, sort of step in and say, you got to come join us? Or did you, I mean, your relationship with those guys kind of precede the 2K relationship? It, it, it did, yeah. I, I mean, because those guys were my, were my friends and remained my friends for as long as I was at, I was at 2K. Um, so at 2K, I worked, uh, it, it was another sort of big change for me, even though I, my title was still producer at 2K, but I went from being, um, on a development team in, at EA, where I was, I was like closer to being a designer there on on Command and Conquer, um, and then at Two K, I worked on the publishing side um, with a developer that was based in Berlin, in Germany, so that <laughs> uh, on the other side of the globe. So that was a um, day to day. That was a that was a big change. The other really sort of uh, huge change that happened to me personally as part of that was that. All the while, while I was in LA, I was I, I like never permanently relocated there. So I was essentially commuting to oh. Los Angeles for almost three years, oh. and had um, from my 
from my home in uh, here in Northern California and um, leaving my my wife and my daughter who was about th two three at the time for like two week two weeks at a time sometimes more when yeah. we were crunching uh, and that was like that was one of those things where I never we never would have done it I don't think if we had known it would go, go on for as long as it did, we just kept deferring on relocating for mm -hmm. one reason or another. And I never like found the sort of stability and comfort in Los Angeles to where it felt like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I got the job at 2K, it met, uh, 2K is based uh, in Marin County. Um, and so I was, I was thrilled, you know, to be able to come home and, have a job at a uh, at a publisher I had a ton of respect for as they're behind Bioshock and and a bunch of other great games mm -hmm. um, um, but uh, but at the time like shortly b before like shortly before I took that job um, and and my um, my EA colleagues Amir and Gavin had also quit EA around the same time as I did and they were gonna drop everything, move into a house, start making their own game. Um, and, um, and I just couldn't, especially since I was like commuting at the time and stuff, I just like, when push came to shove, I, I, I essentially, whether I chickened out or whether I truly couldn't make those same sacrifices is something I, I'm not entirely sure of, but essentially I'm like, I, I just need a normal, stable job. Um, and, and I can't go from one crazy situation of into, into another, like a crazy, like startup business situation. Like, I think that that will just like devastate my family at this point. Um, so, uh, and those guys are, were dear friends of mine. Um, but I didn't feel like I could, um, I could, uh, work with them in that right. capacity. And thankfully a year later, you know, when they were getting close to, announcing Bastion we just we just kept talking and we found a way to make it work and I had to like you know talk my family into like hey how would you like it if I leave this perfectly good job I have <laughs> for something that like is way less stable and you know so it was kind of a I had to like sell it to my family as it were of like why I should why this isn't a really terrible idea mm. Um, so yeah, okay. that, that's how I, uh, that's how I ended up, you know, j uh, yeah, joining with those guys, um, at Supergiant mm -hmm. and, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we were a lot of the formative ideas about the studio and the kind of games we want to make. It's like, we were all, we, we were all talking about that stuff when we were in between jobs. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like the ideas, even though I'm technically not uh, one of the founders or whatever, uh, <laughs> the, the ideas behind the studio are very near and dear uh, to my heart. Well, let's talk about those. I remember from reading the website a couple days ago that one of the blurbs was, we want to make games that spark your imagination yep. like the kid, or the types of games you played as kids. Yeah. Uh, expound on that. So. Yeah, that's, that's how we... Um, that's what we boiled it down to because we weren't like that statement we like we wrote that around the time when we were like announcing bastion because we're like how do we even uh, like what do we say like, <laughs> like why do we exist like we don't even we're just doing the stuff our way like what is it that we're trying to do um and and our game is like kind of i don't know it's kind of like a throwback but not really like no we don't see it as a throwback this isn't just like a retro we don't think of this as like a retro game um, not that there's anything wrong with retro sure. games. That's just not how we how we approached it. Um, so it was this idea of like, like I I think one of the very powerful things that that games can do is like create a sense of wonder and discovery. So you're playing and you're just like wow, like you 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 have no when you begin a game, you have no ideas, oftentimes or. What can happen with certain games <laughs> is when you begin playing them, you have no idea about how how sort of vast the game is going to be. Uh, I think compared to any other medium, 
um, the the scope of a game is truly unknown. Like when you have a book, you know how long that book is. Right. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. or whatever a movie, most films, there's like experimental films and whatnot, but there's like a formal structure around a typical film. Mm -hmm. um, but games are like there are just there's no almost no definition for what a game even is. And that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, as people play more and more games, they can start to, you know, people can start to get cynical about what's there and just like it, it can start to, when you play, you know, iterative versions year after year or whatever, even if it's on its own merits a really great game, if you've played like five other games like it in the five previous years, there's a good chance that it's not going to be you'll you'll like experience diminishing returns yeah. on an emotional level or whatever like you know what to expect fundamentally um so that like creating that sense of like wonder and discovery for people was something that was important to us and that's why we put it in those terms of like they make you feel like the games you played as a kid mm -hmm. so it's not it's not sufficient to to remake those games because you've already experienced them before right. and it's not going to be the same there's no going back you know to the first time you played Ocarina of Time or or Thief the Dark Project or whatever your, fa your favorite game is um, anything that's similar to those games at best is just going to remind you of playing those games so you have to make something new um, to recapture that that sense of there has to be something new to recapture that sense of wonder or whatever and yeah we also think that like you know yeah the people who are grown up they haven't like lost the ability to feel that way they're just they've just like experienced a lot more stuff it's harder to have a new experience as you get older um maybe hmm. um but so yeah that that statement making games that you know spark players imaginations make them kind of feel like a kid again it's it's really about i think creating that experience of like discovery for people um and, f and finding different ways of doing that um and and yeah i mean we don't know exactly what that there's no formula for that that's very important to us like we don't we don't know what it's going to take to achieve that we just right. know that we don't want to make stuff like we don't want to make stuff that like is just sort of where you could like point to some other thing and be able to say that's just a similar or right we don't even want to make like a better version of existing things because it's the same thing it's right. like we, we we'd rather make something that feels it kind of has its own identity uh, but but still has a sense of familiarity to it as well yeah. or you can like connect to it so well i think i think bastion speaks to that in that it, it it's hard for me to dis I, I was trying to describe the game to Jamie here my lovely Jamie te technician <laughs> and good friend um, I was trying to describe what Bastard must do him yesterday when I was telling him you were coming and it was hard for me yeah. and I feel like that's a good thing you know um, you can't just say I it's like you said you know you don't I don't like saying uh, it's it's like Call of Duty if it had sharks or something, you know, right, right, right. whatever. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that was very, um, we didn't like, we didn't like back solve from that. We didn't uh -huh. like set out to, let's just make something that's totally different. Yeah. <laughs> th that's never our mindset, but, um, but we never came at it from like a, from like a pitch either. Right. It was never like, we didn't, we didn't know we had, we only began to figure out what to even say about it when it came time to like announce it we're like we have to say something right. what are we even going to say <laughs> um and that was and that was hard but but like it was a much more sort of a organic process as far as like the making of it went where yeah we had come from working in environments where games you know sometimes were designed on like a on like a feature basis like here's you right. know we're doing installment x of franchise y mm -hmm. and 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 this year our big features are this, <laughs> um, and and then and like that's that's your game. Like you focus on the you try to make those things work, and then 
you try to build a game around it in the time yeah. you have. Um, and sometimes that goes well and sometimes it doesn't go well. Yeah. Um, and in Bastion, it's just like, especially, you know, since starting out, it was just Amir and Gavin. They're just like, let's make something that, that, <laughs> that we, that we like, you know, <laughs> let's see what it, it's constrained purely by their, or entirely by their abilities. It's like, they, they can't be thinking about some, they're not going to like plan to implement certain big features when they like don't even know if they can do it. Like, let's just get like a character moving on a screen. Let's start there before we're like saying it's going to have, you know, destructible <laughs> skyscrapers or something like that. Right. So, um, and, and it was built out like that, you know, bit by bit. Um, and, and yeah, so, uh, uh, when we, you know, we also knew that, like, we figured we weren't going to, like, excite anybody with just, like, what we had to say about the game. Because we're just, like, we're an unheard of studio. Hmm. There's no reason to think, there's no reason to give us any kind of, there's no reason to believe anything we say. Like, we can say, oh, it's going to be the best game. And, like, why should you believe us? We have no grounds on which to claim that they would like except like we used to work on command and conquer and, uh, we didn't even know how how awesome that was at that time um necessarily so so yeah the whole plan was hey we're just going to make it and get it playable and get it into an environment in which people can play it and for us that was a pax prime of 2010 and that was the first time that people could like yeah we we quite literally let the game do the talking for us um, and and we were it was an amazing experience for us because like people liked it sort of way. The, the the response to it was amazing at the time. We're like, oh, we just need to m deliver on whatever it is that people saw in that like t fifteen or twenty minutes that they played. Um, but we knew that yeah, on paper saying like, oh, it's an action RPG where an old man is talking the entire time. Like we would joke about that because <laughs> it sounds so stupid. <laughs> and, and we knew we consciously knew that like the the stuff that we were doing in this game, it would never ever fly in an environment like like EA where you do have to like pitch an idea to a bunch mm -hmm. of people, uh, you know, and get buy in. But for us, mm -hmm. it was just like it, it was coming from. A personal place, but also like a pragmatic place of like, what can we even do? Right. Um, and and the result, uh, yeah, the result was was Bastion. So it, um, and we want to, and like I said, I mean, we want to keep doing stuff in like a rather uh, intuitive fashion. That way, um, and the the game definitely expresses our our values because um, we care both about the sort of the the physical sensation of playing like the gameplay um, and how you how you use the controls and how often you're taking action and the sorts of things you're doing and then you know the as that relates to the emotional side of it as well and whatever narrative is there and um, the, just kind of the rest of the experience like all those there's so many fights that always happen between like the, the struggle between gameplay and narrative and mm -hmm. like which is more important and it's like like can't it can't they both be important mm -hmm. like is that okay like does one have to I mean and the, the, the game is the more important part to us uh, actually but we don't think that because because the game is what the game is what you play mm -hmm. um, it's the mo the most important thing is like you've elected to play a game you, you're not watching a movie or reading a book or whatever um, yeah. so the what the narrative has other um, has certain pressures on it to not interfere with the playing part that mm -hmm. was kind of our mindset with Bastion that's where the the narrator comes from as someone who is not there to like oh I noticed you were having fun let me force you to flip through, you know, a bunch of text screens or, like, right. watch long cutscenes that prevent you from playing or whatever, which can create, like, an it's games, a, yeah, or, like, an antagonistic kind of feeling. Of like, right. Oh, why, don't, why don't you just let me play, you know? Exactly. That's, like, a really weird feeling to have in games. Um, we didn't ever want that in, in yeah. question. Ground forms up under his feet as it point the way. He don't stop to wonder why. 
finds his lifelong friend just lying in the road. Well, it's a touching reunion. Um, I appreciate that. So, I mean, yeah, <coughs> quick personal example. I, I recently re reviewed Borderlands 2, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, is a, is a good game and fun, and when it works, it really works. And, you know, well, this, I'll just make this quick. Yeah, there's something in, when you're picking up, you know, dozens and dozens of weapons, mm -hmm. and you're just constantly, you know, looking at the numbers, and some people, maybe, they really like that or something, but I, I, I feel like, for what Borderlands is, you know, the, the, best it is, the best it is is when you're, you and a buddy are going in a room and killing a bunch of people with crazy weapons, you know, and it's uh, totally fun and exciting and tension-filled, uh, and then suddenly, two steps later, you go, oh, let me check this gun, and oh, let me check this gun, and so that's something, yeah, that I've noticed, so, so that's where the narrator came from, you'd say, that uh, it, was a, it was an idea to, to give a lot of exposition narration without breaking up the flow. We, we wanted, yeah, we, we knew, like, the, we didn't know what the game was going to be um, early on in the development, but but we did know that we like we wanted to make something that could like um, create a meaningful experience for someone. Like we felt that narrative was a relatively underexplored aspect of the action RPG genre, mm -hmm. which we knew was like a that was a direction we were interested in. Of like we love action RPGs. How come they don't? You know, there's a bunch of games that are like Diablo, and the Diablo thing is like really well executed and well understood but how come they're not doing this stuff over here mm -hmm. um so that's kind of where our heads were at initially um but but then yeah we knew that like we knew that we couldn't let any narrative like sort of interrupt the the pace of the game we wanted it to be the sort of game that anyone can pick up and start playing within seconds get in there because we were thinking of it as like hey this might be an xbox live arcade game and you don't want your giant, you know, Star Wars text crawl at the beginning. Or <laughs> any of that, any of those kind of RPG storytelling conventions um, would would interfere with like an action oriented uh, play experience. So yeah, eventually, you know, several months into the development, that led to um, uh, Amir's first experiments with the with the narration, um, and and again, that was another thing that was like kind of a pragmatic. Um, solution in our case because uh amir and darren our audio director uh are were mutual friends with this guy named logan cunningham who's an actor in new york um and they'd known they'd all known each other since they were like playing soccer <laughs> age 10 or something and hey logan can you record a few lines for us um and yeah, they put him in the game and and, <laughs> and it was uh, and it was pretty interesting um and and it happened to align um really well with uh some of the story and thematic ideas that that we had. It's not it's not Logan's natural speaking voice or anything like yeah. that. Um, but we realized it was a way to express the kind of tone that we were interested in, because we were already thinking about it being this kind of a uh, this like fantasy western, this like kind of a uh, you know what if Cormac McCarthy instead of writing these like grim you know southern gothic novels, what if he like was making little Zelda games? Like what, what would they sound like? That that was one of the things. So, yeah, that's and, and that's where, yeah, and th that's where some of the, like, initial voice direction stuff came from. Mm. Um, and, yeah, we, we, we liked it and kind of kept, kept going with it, never, never looked back. There's, there's things like, uh, the moment, it sounded really cool, and then he would, like, it would go quiet, you know, where we didn't have narration, or he would, like, repeat a line, like, oh, you know, if you, we realized we couldn't do any kind of play-by-play -play stuff, and that we, we had to set certain rules around him that he is there to give context to mm -hmm. like reveal information that you as a player could not discern on your own mm -hmm. um about the world and so forth like because if he's just saying you know boom shakalaka like <laughs> or something like that that's like super awesome the first time or yeah. maybe three times but but it in our case we wanted to create this illusion of like a storyteller and the moment he repeats his lines um it, it, the illusion is broken right. so we're like okay, he's just never gonna repeat his lines then, if you just play the game through, um, which turned it into like a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of writing work. But I, right. I, I loved that stuff. It was super, 
it was just incredibly re rewarding to work on. It was yeah. very hard, uh, yeah. but very re rewarding as well. Uh, what made what made the narrator ultimately uh, really brilliant for me was the fact that it was all in present tense. Oh, cool! In the game, Thank, yeah, yeah. It, what people don't, mo most people don't don't uh, pick up on that detail, but you're, <laughs> you're a writer, <laughs> so. Um, that yeah, how did that? How did you guys? Was that was there a big discussion about that, or was it just something that? That was like. That no, that was like an early ground rule, of like, that that's what. Keeping it as present. I was as I was thinking about the writing of it and like oh it ha it, this is the only way it makes sense like it doesn't make sense any other <laughs> uh, j just to keep it um, <clears throat> the game actually plays with tense a little bit but for the most part you know it's that experience that the story is un unraveling kind of as as you go but you're also it's the sense that like you don't know what the story's end is going to be until you get there and that's why like the present tense is important and it also keeps it feeling very immediate because mm -hmm. uh, if it's just like and then he went so and so <laughs> then it's just like hey this already happened like it feels less important if it's being talked about in the past tense because it's already happened and then your actions I think are like it takes something away from what you're doing um, so the 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 him telling it in the present tense even though it's sort of a past tense story, um, gave it a, it just felt right. Um, so we, we had some, I don't know that we even discussed it very much. Cool. It just, it just seemed like the right thing to do in that case. But there was a whole, like, you know, there was a whole sort of framing of what, like who he's talking to, why he's telling the story. Like mm -hmm. those things were super important to me from the beginning. Like it, it wasn't just like, Hey, we have a we have a narrator because it couldn't. To me, it was like the key to why any of it would be interesting at all. It's like if if there's going to be a guy talking, then my first questions are why is he talking? Yeah. My second question is who is he talking to? Um, and and so I I came up with. You know, I had thoughts about that early on, like why why he's telling the story, to whom is he telling it, and then. A whole bunch of interesting stuff came out of there, and that's that. Stuff like that is is what could sort of keep me going, from from like sort of moment to moment in the writing, because I because I could always think about like what's his what's his agenda, like why is he, why is he saying this stuff, um, and that that just made it fun to think about and fun to write and stuff like that. And then I didn't it, it, like expect that the average person would like. I think that stuff is just. It just makes it more interesting whether you pick up on it or not. And then I was pleasantly surprised to find that, like, some people did pick up on it and didn't mm -hmm. notice, you know, dig into it and find, um, like, all the stuff I, like, buried in the story and thought no one would, didn't really ex expect anyone to pick up on. Like, people found all that stuff, which was really rewarding. That is nice. Yeah. Especially for your first big project. Yeah. Right? So as the game was was being birthed, uh, was the idea was the um, the piecing the you know re piecing together of the land was that something that came out of was that just a, a, an experiment was that something that came out of limitations or was it something that was truly really sort of inspired yeah. by something different Yeah. So the 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 way that the land forms up around you that was like one of the first sort of um, that was one of the first ideas that actually stuck. Um, oh. I, that was a very early idea. Uh, that's expressed in like the earliest uh, prototypes of the game um, and it was all about like hey let's make we want to make an isometric game that's but like two things that you know sorry uh, we we knew we wanted to make an isometric game but like in in games like Diablo and in typical games like that you you have a map and it'll be like in the corner or overlaid over what you're playing and Maps, you know, can be kind of ugly, they can be disorienting, and they take a lot of work to implement. So before we just assume that we are going to have a map, let's see if we can direct the player. Let's see if we can, like, um, solve the problem that maps solve in some other way. Um, and, and secondary to that was, like, you know, 
the one problem with an isometric game when you're is that like you can never see the sky because the camera is looking at the ground. And if we're going to make some kind of fantasy adventure, it would be nice if you could have some kind of cool sweeping vistas. And how do we do that? Is there a way where you could see the sky even though the camera is pointing at the ground? So we're like, hey, maybe the game takes place on a bunch of floating islands. And maybe the world just kind of forms up around you as you go. Um, and we tried that and it was pretty cool. Mm. Um, and then that in turn uh, fed back uh, into the fiction significantly. Um, and we realized it had like interesting connections to the kind of themes that we were thinking about, uh, which is that ba Bastion was going to be like the, the, the first idea, the way that Amir talked about it, you know, early on is like an action RPG in which you build a world around you. And that was it. Um, and we're like, Hey, that this seems kind of cool. It's like, the world is being restored or something like that mm -hmm. as you go. Like, that seem, seems kind of promising. So, yeah, we, we ran with that. And we try to... So, and that's kind of... Um, it's a good example of our process where we approach things first and foremost from, like, a... We, we, we try to solve the design problems that we have, and we're, we're more than willing to resort to using convention where it makes sense, but we try never to assume, we, we never take the convention for granted. Like if we're gonna use a conventional solution to something like have a life bar or, you know, give you three lives or whatever, uh, any of those things that are typical in games, we're not just gonna do that because other games do it. We're gonna like go through the thought process of like, let's try something different from this and when that's super terrible, you know, <laughs> we might fall back on the other thing, but we're going to at least appreciate why that convention exists uh, through the process of getting there. And sometimes we can find ways that aren't conven conventional, as with the world forming up around you instead of having a mini-map, mm. you know. So, um, and, and then even when we do uh, use something that's conventional, we'll try to at least um, justify it within the context of what we're doing um even if it's as simple as what we call it or like you know in bastion you essentially have three lives but it's like there are chances to carry on right you know, they're, not, they're not lives um so even like a simple tweak like that is like it, you're at least making it feel like it fits with your game instead mm -hmm. of just something that you lifted another another way another aspect of the design that i felt was pretty remarkable um, was the variable difficulty yeah. uh, with the <laughs> idols yeah and you know at first I didn't I didn't think much of it till, till towards the end of the game I said oh my god I, I didn't choose easy medium hard right, right I'm making it as hard as I want it to be and which could be pretty hard yeah, exactly. <laughs> when the when all the when the enemies had the little grenades that yeah, drop yeah. them every time you kill them I <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I screamed at your game at that point. I had to turn off that idol after after a few hours. Like, fuck, sorry. Man, God damn it. <laughs> like, but at least it's talking. your fault and That's not right. the game's fault. Right, totally. I mean, it, it says right up front. It's like, yeah. it's going to get harder. Here you go. Yeah. I, I think, um, I, think I, I hope that people can take that idea and, 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 um, and, I mean, yeah, I hope that people can give you guys credit for that in, in some way, but... Um, yeah, what what a great design choice. Where did that uh, where did that come Thank, from? Thanks. Yeah, I mean that that came from. Um, so we had a lot of. I I'm glad people like that system. It, it took. Um, it it went through a lot of different iterations until it ended up what it was. Um, but the the basic, and again from like a design problem solving perspective, where that came from was the sense of like, we don't want to give you a blind choice at the beginning of the game. A lot of games start with. What would you like this to be? Easy, <laughs> medium, or hard? You're like, According I don't know. Food. I haven't, yeah, <laughs> like I haven't played it yet. I don't right. know what I want. And, and <laughs> a lot of games, you know, most games at this point, they'll like give you, you know, a short paragraph right. saying like, this is for people experience. And I think that stuff helps a lot mm -hmm. to give context to what that choice is. But still, you can't truly make that choice confidently until you've had some chance to actually play the game and calibrate it against your own ability. So that's where um, the desire to you know, start everyone off in the same place, but um, introduce a system where you can make the game harder for yourself um, if you want and get some sort of in-game reward for it right. so that there's some... We, we didn't want to just sort of 
we wanted people to do it for its own sake, but we also wanted it to like not be. Uh, there's an inherent penalty with making the game harder. We wanted it to be counterbalanced by something, so we give you you know additional experience and stuff like that. I think people would have expected no less. <laughs> um, but then there was uh, you know there was a big challenge in like how to communicate that and how to tie that into the world. Like mm -hmm. as as the fiction of our game started to take shape, it's like how do we make sense of anything like this? Because it, it started the first idea for it was like a like a bestiary thing where you were like researching different creatures um and and you would research them and that would like make them more powerful <laughs> uh yeah so it started to fall apart um it, it didn't make sense and and there was also like it was too specific because it was around each like individual enemy but you didn't even know if you were going to fight that enemy again you know after you had fought, fought it in a particular level so we had to like generalize it more and anyway at some point i don't even uh, you know we're like hey maybe if this is just doing weird fantastical stuff it, it's just like changing the properties of enemies maybe it's just religion like, yeah it's just god <laughs> um and and we realized like hey in this kind of world um expressing something about the religion of the world is actually like a cool facet to explore that seems to tie together and i i yeah i personally like how how that stuff it's just a cool sort of it's a cool aspect of of kind of the 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 world of the game that it's these and says something about the world that it's gods who don't they don't make your life they don't just make your life easier you don't just pray to these gods and they're like oh sh sweet thanks <laughs> i'll just make like this is a hard living kind of world where even if you pray to the gods like you might be you might want to be careful about that you might not want to draw their attention it seemed to like uh, you know, contribute to the kind of tone that we wanted to strike. So, so yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that it was well, well received. Cool. But it, yeah, it's it's <laughs> definitely an example of how we approach. You try to like integrate both the design and sort of the the fiction and thematic material into into one. It's not truly sort of complete and, unless all of those pieces can somehow fit together. Mm. Ah, and they do. And that game, it's it's a great game. Um, but remind me not to go to church with you. <laughs> yeah. <I don't> <laughs> um, uh, cool. Well, um, I just have a, well, I have a couple more questions for yeah. you. And, um, the first being that, uh, still talking about Bastion. Um, I know, I read on your blog that you didn't do writing for the game until it was it was taking shape as a playable experience. Right. Can the opposite not be true for you ever? Could you ever come up with an idea and oh. say we want to make something you know out of this? Well, so um, the the thing I would uh, I would clarify is like the 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 story like the idea for the story definitely existed uh, before. It's just that I wouldn't get to writing the narration until we had a playable level. I see. Because we we had. Um, be, because the narration is intended to be tied so closely to the moment-to-moment -moment experience, uh, and and the gameplay has to drive the level, um, typically um, that we build it first, and then you know based on the the general stuff that's supposed to happen in the story, I would then write it like moment by moment. Um, so there existed like a big outline of the story and a big sort of world document about what this world is like uh, before there were a bunch of levels but um, the actual writing of like the stuff that you hear him say wouldn't occur until we first um, built something playable uh, if uh, to make that distinction yeah. so the the but the ideas for the story um, are from pretty early in the project um, the the like the high level ideas cuz like like the the thematic stuff and everything and even the like the idea that there's going to be like like the even the name bastion um was sort of like the it was like the co that was the name of the project pretty much all along cuz it was always going to be about like you know finding this after after some of those initial decisions were made it was always going to be like you find this last place that like didn't get destroyed after mm -hmm. some 
weird event. So those ideas were there kind of from the start, and then the exact details took shape. Um, but we, to, to answer your question more directly, I mean, there are some games that are created based on their story, um, but we are not that type of studio. We, um, uh, for us, you know, the play experience is fundamentally the thing that matters, um, and the story the, whatever narrative is there exists in the service of that play experience. Um, and, and that is not to say it's like, um, it's like a menial part of the game. It's, it's as, as evidenced by something like Bastion, we, it's, it's very important to us, but we're not just gonna like, uh, like if all we wanted to do was tell a story, then we wouldn't be making games. We would be telling stories in some more efficient way sure. <laughs> in the form of like, right. you know, a screenplay or something sure. like that. Uh, there, are, there are purer forms of storytelling than games. Um, so, and because again, we think that, uh, you know, we want to we wanna deliver uh, narrative in games in ways that only games can deliver it. Um, and that means uh, building something first. You can't just do that on paper. Because yeah. if you just write it on paper, then you could publish it on paper or whatever. So, yeah, right. in, in, in Bastion's case, there's story ideas, blah, 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 but the ideas are cheap until we find a way to, like, actually communicate those ideas in the game, right. which in our case was with this with this narrator. We're like, okay, we have this voice. This actually seems promising. We're going to try to express all this stuff using this particular technique. Um, and he can kind of respond directly to some of the stuff you're doing, which can make it feel um, pretty personal to you, even though it's like a crafted story with like a beginning and then middle and end and stuff like that. So trying to find that right balance between having, you know, essentially a linear narrative, uh, like a like a traditional story, but also something where you feel like you're a part of it and directly influencing it. Because um, we like other games that do that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, try and do it and do it our own way. Cool. Um, well, then allow me to allow me to finish up uh, our talk by asking how much of your work as a critic mm -hmm. influences what you've done in, in Bastion and 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 your day to day work. You know how how often. Do you, does that ever run away with you? Is it sort of like a monster, or have you have you been able to separate them? Um, it's. I mean, I think the 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 thing that I I guess I can't separate is like my like the my 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 background as a critic from my background as like a game player because I because I because I started writing about games pretty early on, so I started thinking about them critically for whatever that meant to, I, I, you know, other people can decide whether I was sort of appropriately critical or not. But in my mind, I was trying to be, I was trying to think about when I like something like, or when I don't like something, why? Just a simple question. <laughs> but I think it, it, it's, it's sort of the origin of critical thought, right? You just like have an emotional reaction to something and you, start to become introspective about it. Like, why did this work for me? Why do I like this better than that exactly? Um, and then, you know, started trying to articulate that in words by writing about games, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and in turn, I was playing a lot of stuff. And um, so that, just a background of having played a lot of different stuff is super important to me. It makes me, it's sort of the one, it's the one thing that gives me anything resembling confidence um because i just like hey if nothing else i can say i've played a lot of games uh and i know i know what i like um so i don't always know how to get there in my own work but i can always evaluate something and decide whether I like what I do or don't like about it and what I would change or not change about it and stuff like that and just being able to 
having some sort of vo vocabulary around how to communicate those things uh, is really helpful because so much of game development, at least in in the places I've worked, it's so much about the collaboration and it's just like, because it doesn't matter what great ideas you have if you can't uh, if you can't execute them and in my case my actual skill set uh, is pretty limited since I can't program and I can't uh, make music that's as great as you know I can't make music like Darren can't make artwork like like Jen my my role is more abstract or and and likewise even with the story it's like the the story would have been uh, much less potent um, in a, in any other medium because it was written for this medium. So mm -hmm. I need to be able to uh, collaborate well with people and uh, having having written about games and thought about them a lot and played a lot of them, it it's just allows us to uh, hopefully make uh, make better decisions about how to make them, knowing what works and doesn't work, and or at least thinking you know what works and what doesn't work, <laughs> and that can be enough. Mm. Uh, I like that a lot. I, you know, thought about that question and <laughs> was scared of there being, you know, some negative response, you know, uh, but, you know. Really? Like, like how? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, or just because um, I can imagine myself in this situation, yeah. you know, and making a game and just deciding that, oh, this is just like this other game, you know, yeah, you know, or I'm I'm doing them a disservice, you know, blah blah blah. Like I got to throw this away, and because you know you spent so much time with games, and yeah. Blah, blah, blah. But so that's good. I like that it's been positive for you. You see, no, for blah. sure. I mean, it, there are certainly the moments of the extreme uh, <laughs> self criticism mm -hmm. as well. Like this is this is hopeless. Uh, hopelessness is, I think, a key part of game development <laughs> just <laughs> for just about everyone I've. Uh, I've I've met, but um, but yeah, I mean I'm I'm. Like I said, yeah, the the, the my. I I feel like there are a lot of people out there who think games, can be more and games can be better and my my own. I understand that, but. I love, games that that I played as a kid so much that like I would be, perfectly okay with beginning to approach how good any of those games were <laughs> like I, I like i'm i don't think i'm i think people's memories are short and all the cool innovative stuff that games are doing these days you can chances are you could trace it back to some game from the early 90s or the late 80s or something that like basically did all this stuff already <laughs> um so i i just want to follow in the tradition of Th this kind of game making that I think has always been there for as long as the industri industry has been around rather than just like oh like uplift the table and have <laughs> sort of no respect for the for the roots of where the stuff came from because the people who were making good games back then making games is super hard now and like I just I can barely <sighs> there's so many free tools and <laughs> it's so easy now it seems by comparison and I still can't do it myself <laughs> so wow um, great well I'm really glad that uh, it's been a positive experience for you and uh, and I want to thank you for your work um, and everyone at Supergiant Games uh, all of them there uh, I really enjoy Bastion and I really enjoy uh, all your thoughts on you know what it's taken to make a great game so uh thanks for coming on the show and uh, thank you yeah you know. until until the next one all right uh thanks everyone for watching again this is a state of play with brandon bales and my guest has been greg kasavin we'll see you next time